On the south coast of England, between the lush rolling hills and fields of Sussex and the English Channel, lies the sleepy seaside town of Worthing, which on the surface is an ordinary place. However, most people are unaware that merely a few miles out into the countryside, one of the neighbouring villages harbours a dark and disturbing secret. Clapham Village is a peaceful community with little more than 300 residents. On the outskirts of the village stands the parish church, and what has often been noted as the eerily quiet surrounding woods, where strange phenomena have been documented over the years. Since the 1960s, Clapham Woods has been a hotspot for UFO sightings. Walkers have reported experiencing nausea and the sensation of being pushed by unseen forces. Patches of grey mist and orbs have also been spotted on pathways throughout the woods. In the 70s, things in Clapham Woods took a more sinister turn. Pets, notably dogs, were disappearing without trace and people were starting to go missing. Between 1972 and 1981, four deaths were associated with the wood, including the death of Reverend Harry Snelling. The body of the former Clapham vicar was found three years after his disappearance in the woods. Subsequently, local rumours began to spread and the media took an interest. Articles were printed debating the credibility of evidence gathered, as some speculated on the evidence of a satanic cult performing rituals. One man can often be seen roaming the woods today in search of the answers. Charles Walker, an ex-council worker from Worthing, has been investigating the Friends of Hecate for over 30 years. They're a group that were formed, it would seem, in Sussex, and particularly in the Clapham area. They're devoted to the uh, ancient goddess Hecate, who uh, once was sort of queen of the witches, um, kind of a fallen angel, if you like. She became goddess of the graveyards and of the crossroads. Evidence of their activity today was found at the crossroads in Clapham Woods and significantly a number of dogs went missing. In art and in literature, Hecate is constantly represented as dog-shaped or as accompanied by a dog. The dog was Hecate's regular sacrificial animal and was often eaten in solemn sacrament. Having spoken to some of the pet owners who'd lost their animals and a, a couple that had to be put down after coming out of the woods, it was that. Uh, that led on to the thing of the connection between witchcraft and this, which was totally different. And having been involved in witchcraft for a long time, that was very annoying. People speculate that the occult and black magic are responsible for disappearances in the woods, although it is often a misunderstood subject. Charles was keen to outline the differences between the two. Black magic, so-called black magic, sort of works on, on the idea of um, acquiring powers, energies and things for yourself, whereas white magic is more in line with um, modern thinkings of, of becoming one with the earth and the wildlife around it and life itself. So it tends to look after the planet and people, whereas so-called black magic is just out for destruction, basically. And there's always a confusion there. They always get used together. But beyond that, that, that you know, that, that is it. And, it, it. and that's another, that is, as I said, part of the reason why I want to keep this going and to stop them and to stop the association, prove that it's nothing to do with witchcraft if it comes down to it. As the rate of investigations grew, Charles began to find more telltale signs of a cult at work. To date, there have been numerous findings, including cleaned animal guts, cult markings, and even demonic paintings found in a property belonging to a local villager. During the mid-90s, there was a substantial find when one of Charles's investigations stumbled upon something slightly more peculiar. Most of the time, anybody going up to the woods, you stick to the footpaths, strictly stick to the footpaths. Based on our investigations, we sort of strayed off the footpaths quite a bit at various times, not causing any damage, I hasten to add, but we wandered off the footpaths. And we eventually came across, I mean, it looked like a large, quite tight bush. Um, but having plodded about a bit, it turned out to actually be a very, very well-disguised hide which somebody constructed very carefully. Um, and, well, you could actually, you could almost live in it. But it looked to us as though it had actually been constructed 
almost like a, a preparation area where you might prepare yourself for a ritual. Or It wouldn't be big enough to actually do any rituals in, but it would certainly be, be big enough to get a few people in to, to prepare or even to retire had they got disturbed or something. Clapham's rise in notoriety as a satanic hotspot has fueled investigations, short videos and even a reality TV show. In recent years, easy accessibility to the internet has helped to create a surge of interest in the woods in the form of YouTube videos, blogs and forum discussions. Wishing to learn more, we asked Charles to join us on a daytime visit to Clapham in a bid to further understand his motivation at this stage and get a feel for the place ourselves. Right, well, we're at now at Clapham Church, and, I mean, for all the things that have happened everywhere around Clapham, the church itself has never, ever been touched. There's never been anything found here to indicate anything going on at all, no desecrations of any description. I think with a group like the Friends of Akati, to attack the church would be so obvious it would be so silly, it would attract massive publicity at the time anyway. And of course, bear in mind that although the church is isolated from the village, you can actually see the church from the manor house. Well, we're now here at the site of the what's become known as the sacred tree, the large beech tree here. Uh, and it's this tree now around which we're almost certain the Friends of Akati now meet on a reasonably regular basis. Um, odd bits and pieces have been found around the tree. Uh, remains of incense, candles, but it's, it's limited because, again, they don't usually leave that much about. Unfortunately, these days there is a lot of vandalism, an example of which over here. I mean, we do often come across that sort of thing, unfortunately. So we have to take that into account when we're, we're looking about for evidence. Now, this is a, this is a, a bit here where uh, apart from anything else, there is a, a ley line going through. Whoops, dear. Uh, and it's also the part where I'm going to get a bit nervous about this now because this is the part where under many occasions I've felt very, very ill. The ley line runs almost in line with this ridge. So I will <laughs> gently step over the, whoops, over the mark and see, see what happens. At the moment, there doesn't seem to be any problem at all. No, I don't feel too bad at all. Fortunately. Now the ley line runs through this area here and it will run from here in that direction towards uh, Chanctonbury Ring. Um, and that's one of the reasons I think why, the, and we, from the research we've done, why the Friends of Akati would use the area because of the, the apparent ley line. Perhaps only a few, foot, few feet wide, um, they're lines of energy, natural, the natural energy of the earth, which generates, it goes around the whole of the earth joins up at various locations, usually historical sites, funnily enough. Whether they were built there because of the energy or not is another matter. Very often when it's at its strength, full strength, uh, you'll get a reading on this. But there doesn't seem to be any change in the magnetic field at all at the moment, which is typical. But normally it, it would go quite high when I felt ill. Other people have had this on at the time when they've come to see what's wrong, uh, and we've had a very high reading from it. Because one of the other things that we always find up here, we know that something's been going on, is um, symbols, markings, often done on the, on the large beech tree over there. Um, but the point with them is that it, the ones we know have got to be reasonably genuine are very obscure occult markings, symbols that not any old Tom Dick would know. You know, if somebody was coming up here to mess about and try and make up evidence, as it were, um, they wouldn't know this type of symbol unless they did a lot of research first. I mean, it's often... Two or three times it's taken us quite a while to find out what the actual symbol is, what it was meant, what it signifies. Finally, Charles led us to the infamous crossroads, where he claims to have encountered an associate of the Friends of Hecate in the winter of 1978. I got a phone call from a rather well-spoken chap who gave a certain amount of information over the phone and asked me if I would meet him in Clapham to discuss the situation further, which I duly did. At that point, he said they'd formed themselves there about 30 years previous and that they were involved in animal sacrifices and that they intended to continue doing so and were devoted to the goddess Hecate. Now, I mean, th this is their crossroads. This is where I met the um, initiate from the Friends of Hecate who told me all about it. It was over in that area there. Um, 
there was a small tr bushy tree there, uh, as well as this, this uh, undergrowth and such like, you could actually get round behind the tree, and it was there that he was standing when he gave me all the information. Um, and it was from that that we dis actually discovered that they were meeting in this area, actually just in front of me over there, uh, there's a little track, and behind that, again, bigger trees than there are there now, there was a horseshoe-shaped clearing, and that is where they initially met. As evening began to close in, members of Charles's entourage arrived to assist with a routine night investigation of the area. Joining us were members of the paranormal association NAPSI. NAPSI stands for the National Association for Paranormal Science and Investigations, and what the main aims are is number one is to help promote other neighbour like you've got occult and paranormal with Charles. Um, and it's also to try and encourage others to get involved with the paranormal, um, especially the younger generation as well, because even though you can't see it, doesn't mean it's not there. And so it's people like Charles and ourselves, and what we do is we go out there and we try and, you know, collect evidence and we try to do research to try and prove that the paranormal does exist uh, and that if you do believe in it, it's not something that others should laugh at. I had no idea what was going on up this wood until Charles put me straight and he showed me a few items of uh, things that he's found and some pretty alarming evidence. So I had to go with the fact that uh, there were satanic rituals being carried out up at the tree, which is about a quarter of a mile from here. Um, because I've lived here for uh, quite a number of years, uh, I've actually had confrontations in the woods with members of witch, witch covens and everything else. Uh, and that sort of pushed me to, to try and find out more about them. Uh, but obviously because it's all to do with the paranormal, I'm also interested in, in the ghost side of it as well. In the past we have had a number of um, very strange sensations and feelings up at this, up at this area. And uh, quite a few visitations from unwanted people. But there's the actual people carrying out these rituals. They've always been fairly clever and fairly, fairly well one step ahead of us. So we've always uh, never really managed to get close enough to them to see what actually goes on. Basically the operation for, for this evening is, uh, as we normally do, is uh, we'll have a scout round at the areas we know have been active. Uh, we'll use an EMF meter to check for any energy fields that might be high and not normally there. Uh, and also we'll use an Ouija board as a spirit contact. So, I mean, I'm not particularly psychic, um, so we have to use something else as a channel if, to see if there's anything else going on, anything going on. And then, of course, it's a matter of wait and see. I mean, we may see somebody up here, we may not. It just depends. It just depends. I mean, it's fairly quiet. Um, and it usually is about this time of evening, so uh, it, it's vaguely possible, yeah, yeah. But if anybody is going to operate here, they would usually send somebody up in advance anyway. I mean, all groups would do that, doesn't matter what tradition they follow, pagan, Wiccan, whatever. They'll send somebody up and just look like an ordinary walker, just to check around and make sure there's nobody about, you know, campers or anything else like that. Check the area is safe and operate from there, basically. <laughs>